So I'm Eric Wolski. Uh, I work at the Savannah Institute as the uh, field establishment lead. And I, I'm also a graduate student finishing up my PhD at the University of Illinois, uh, studying black currents and uh, red currents and white currents as well, but mainly black currents and using uh, drones to measure them. And uh, so just a quick overview, Savannah Institute, uh, our mission is to catalyze the development and adoption of resilient, scalable agroforestry. And agroforestry includes currents. So today we are joined by Chris McGuire of Two Onion Farm, who's gonna talk about some of his research on trellising currents, which is gonna be incredibly exciting and is a very big thing that's done in Europe, but has been very um, limited, I'd say, in the United States, if it's done at all. So uh, Chris, you're one of two people I know, both in Wisconsin, who have trialed these currents and trellising. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Chris, and uh, I'm excited to see what you got. And hey, for everyone yeah. else, real quick, I, just to say, uh, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat, and we can go through those at the end. So, all right, Chris, take it away. Super. Thank you, Eric. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. I've got a PowerPoint I wanna go through. Can you all see that? Okay. So yeah, as Eric said, I'm Chris McGuire from Two Onion Farm and gonna talk about uh, trellising currants and gooseberries. And I'll just start off with a little overview of our farm. Uh, so my wife, Yuli, and I have farmed here since 2003. Um, we have about 12 acres and we're in far Southwest Wisconsin between Madison and Dubuque, Iowa. And we started out um, primarily growing organic vegetables, so annual crops. Um, and we um, began transitioning over to perennials in around 2012 and eventually sort of dropped the vegetables completely and are now only growing perennial crops. So we currently have a little over two acres of apples and a half acre of currants and gooseberries. We also sell some bedding plants, so seedlings from our greenhouse. And sorry, um, the um, primary markets are community supported agriculture and direct to grocery stores. Um, we're primarily selling fresh fruit, but we do sell some processed value added products as well. So as far as the currants and gooseberries specifically, um, we initially established sort of a small planting back in 2012 and 2013 and decided pretty quickly that we didn't want to produce either of these crops at a very large scale, um, primarily because harvest uh, was so labor intensive um, and also secondarily because of pretty severe disease issues with the gooseberries in particular. Uh, so we kind of kept plants around and you know we're growing them, keeping an eye on them, marketed them mostly kind of informally but didn't want to delve into it more until 2020 when we uh, decided to go ahead and plant the current half acre that we have now. Um, and our sort of farm's labor situation had changed and we were more willing to take on the big job of harvesting these berries in summer. Um, and we also had some grant funding as an opportunity to try out this trellising method that I'll be talking about. And we're hoping that that would reduce the labor burdens and also reduce the disease um, issues in the gooseberry. So, um, just some sort of background about trellising in general. Uh, the, the sort of traditional method that's most widely done, as Eric mentioned, in this country is to grow these plants as freestanding bushes. And that's what you see in the foreground in this picture on the slide. Um, and so, you know, both of these plants kind of send up a lot of shoots naturally from their base, from the crown of the plant. And when you grow them as bushes, you're just allowing those shoots to come up kind of pruning out old ones because they're less fruitful. So generally you want, you want to have shoots that are one, two and three years old and nothing older than that. And, you know, maybe thinning some out to keep the canopy a little more open. But, you know, basically this is a pretty low input 
low labor method of managing the plants. You don't have to build a trellis. You don't spend a lot of time with pruning. Um, but the downside is you're, you're going to develop a pretty dense canopy um, and you may spend a lot of time harvesting because, you know, they're berries, they're hard to time consuming to pick to begin with. And then when you're foraging into a really dense canopy to do your picking, it's very time consuming. Um, in the case of gooseberries, these plants have thorns. Uh, so that makes it even more challenging to pick from a dense canopy. And then the, the, the canopy is also, you know, blocking sunlight, reducing air penetration, increasing humidity. So they're likely to have more disease um, and probably smaller, you know, fruit in general as well. Uh, so we'd read about um, the method of trellising that's used in Europe, where it's called the cordon trellising method. And the, where we first read about this was uh, the article that showed on the slide. So this was written by an extension agent from New York, traveled over to the Netherlands and, and reported back on, on how they were doing things there. And this is available free online, uh, the New York Fruit Quarterly from 2005. Um, and basically, he, you know, he describes the training method and says that it um, reduced I mean, improve fruit quality and um, reduce disease. So basically, the, the cordon in the cordon trellis method is a permanent vertical stem. So you're sort of, in a sense, growing it like a tree, where you've got this permanent stem that's growing vertically and is trained to the trellis, and um, fruit are being produced on horizontal branches that grow off of the cordon. And you're really fighting against the plants that are natural tendency to produce shoots from near the ground by pruning them off. So you see in the picture here, you know, the, um, you can actually see there's some stubs of shoots that have been cut off near the base of the plant. And you're continually doing that during the life of the plant and just forcing it to focus its energies on those, those one or three cordons. Um, there's some different ways of doing it, um, depending, you know, whether you just have one cordon per plant or several. And there's a couple different sort of technical methods of actually pruning the plant that I'll just sort of go through um, quickly because different people sometimes talk about different ones and it's good to know what it is that they're actually referring to. Um, and they're both described in that article I mentioned, um, but basically there's what's called the Dutch technique. And that's what we've been doing on our farm and it's more common in the Netherlands as you'd expect. Um, and uh, what it, what's being shown in this slide is in the picture on the left um, represents a cordon at the beginning of the growing season, like in March. And that's the black stem that you see there. And it's got three green branches growing off to the side. Those are branches that grew last year, the previous season. The middle picture shows the same plant like in early July before harvest. And those last year's branches are now producing an abundant crop of berries. And the cordon has also grown three new branches in the current season, which are shown by the thin green lines. Then after harvest, uh, the grower goes through and cuts off all the fruiting branches. So those, those branches that grew last year are now gone. And the only thing that's left are the branches that grew this year. And they'll be left, they'll be there over the winter and next season, those will be the ones that produce fruit. And this is, goes on annually. Um, so the only permanent part of the plant here is that vertical cordon that's trained to the trellis. All the branches are temporary and they're cut off after they've had their chance to produce fruit. This is a picture of a gooseberry plant that's been trained to this technique. And then basically the, the key thing here is that you know, you've got, a long, got some long branches that are, have a lot of fruit on them. Um, and those will be again cut off as soon as harvest is done. And then new branches that are, you can kind of make out in this picture and um, are what will produce the fruit next year. Now the alternative is what's called the English pruning method. Um, and here you see in the picture on the left, at the start of the season, you've got a lot of short branches, like spurs. Um, so there, there are more of them, but they're pretty short, usually just two or three buds on each of those branches. During the summer, each of those little spurs has a few fruit clusters on it. And it's also 
supporting some new vegetative growth, you know, new shoots that are growing out to the side, extending those short branches. After harvest, you don't do any pruning, but instead you come back in the winter and you reshorten each of those branches back down to two or three buds. Um, so the difference is basically you have more branches, but they're kept really short. Um, and you're not, then they, a branch can actually last for many years. Um, it's just being continually cut back short, not eliminated after every season. Uh, and here's a picture. Uh, this is from another grower, Jason Fishbach, who's an extension agent in, in Northern Wisconsin. It has a trial where he's trellising currents actually inside a high tunnel. That's why you see the, the high tunnel frame behind him. But th they're using the English technique there. So you can see this is just after pruning, like in March or early April. And all the branches on the cordon have been cut back to short stubs. Um, and those are what will, will bear the fruit. Uh, in the coming season. Okay, so um, on our farm, we the, the trial that I'll mostly be talking about um, is, so we received some grant funding in 2020 to establish this. Um, basically, we've got like a replicated field trial with a lot of small plots arranged randomly. Um, and half of them are grown on the cordon trellis and half of them are grown as freestanding bushes. Uh, we have eight different varieties represented here, four currants and four gooseberries. Um, and we've been measuring you know, all the costs, both of materials and also in labor time, and as well as yields. And we'll be continuing this for a few more years. Um, and basically, we're trying to evaluate the profitability of these systems. Um, so an overview of the growing methods um, in the trellised plots are uh, plants are 18 inches apart, whereas they're spaced wider, they're three feet apart in the on trellis. Rows are 10 feet apart. Um, as you can kind of see in the picture, we've got a sod strip in between the rows, but within the row, we're using landscape fabric for mulch uh, to keep weeds down. Um, and then we've got drip irrigation and standard practices um, along each row. So um, in our case, we're using the Dutch pruning method, not the English. So we've got these longer fruiting branches that we're cutting off annually. Um, in the case of the gooseberries, which you see in this picture, we're training each plant to a single cordon. So one permanent stem. Uh, the currants, we're training to three. Um, this is what the, it's generally done in Holland, apparently. We're just imitating that. Um, so in the, in the currents, you know, each, each plant is split in three near the base, and then there's um, three cordons growing up on the trellis. So just an overview of, of how we put the trellis together. Um, we're a certified organic farm, and we're, we're staying away from treated wood in the trellis. Uh, so we're using metal stakes um, at the end of the row. That's the diagonal stake in the, in the diagram here. And then we have a vertical stake every six feet apart down the row. Um, and there's a wire running along the top of the stakes, so the top wire, and then a bottom wire about six inches above the ground um, near the bottom of the trellis. And then there's bamboo stakes suspended between the top wire and the bottom wire next to each cordon. And I have a picture on this slide. So you can see the actual trellis um, early in the spring or just as the plants are breaking bud. Um, you, can, you can kind of see the metal stakes spaced down the row. And then the bottom wire is shown in this picture. The top wire is just off the top of the photo. Um, but there's a, and then the bamboo stakes are actually suspended between the top and bottom wires. They're not in the, in the ground to reduce the you know, likelihood of rot where the stake is contacting the soil. And then the individual cordons are trained or tied to the bamboo stakes with that green tape that you see. And that's a you know, readily available um, plant tie tape, I think they call it. And there's a, a tool, the Max Tapener. It's like a little tape applicator and staple gun all combined in one that you can use to quickly tie the, the cordons to the, to the bamboo stakes. 
Um, people ask about you know, sources and materials. The metal stakes that we use, we buy from this company here, Best Angle Tree Stakes. Um, I'm not affiliated with them or anything, but that's where we've, we've gotten our apple and, and stakes in the past as well. Basically, it's an angle iron piece of metal um, with holes pre-punched in it so you can easily you know, run wires through it or tie things to it if you need to. Uh, this is a, a picture again from Jason Fishbox planting up north. Uh, and I just put it here because uh, they're using, instead of bamboo stakes, actually um, willow shoots, like branches. That I, I think they've you know, cut locally or off that farm. Um, so that you know, could definitely be a, a lower cost alternative rather than buying in thousands of, of bamboo stakes for a current trellis. Um, and you can also see they're using T posts here instead of the angle iron posts. Um, the angle iron is, is comparable in cost to a T post if you buy them in sufficient volume, but it's not readily available in, in small quantities necessarily. Okay, so I um, want to draw attention to the source of our plants in our, in our trial. So I mentioned that we had. Um, we planted four varieties of gooseberry and four of currant. And uh, sort of unbeknownst to us, and frankly, unmentioned by the nursery when we placed the order, um, most of the plants we got were, were started as plugs. So in the past, we'd always planted bare root planting stock, you know, where you're essentially getting a small little bush with bare roots and you plant it early in the spring when it's dormant. Um, these plug plants were basically rooted cuttings. So they're a very short section of stem um, in a small root ball, um, you know, sort of similar to the way you might plant like a, you know, a vegetable transplant or a tomato plant or something, although they didn't have green leaves at the time we planted them. Um, and the, the nursery we purchased from is kind of switching over to plug production. So all the currants we got were actually plugs and uh, two of the four gooseberry varieties were plugs. And this is kind of a new technique for them, at least in, in currants and gooseberries. And I think maybe they haven't quite worked out some of the kinks as far as timing of production and all. But um, unfortunately, they, the plug grown plants were way delayed in their growth and development. Uh, so this picture shows on the left uh, the, uh, some Tixia gooseberries that we started, that we grew from plugs, and on the right, some captivator gooseberries or, or maybe black velvet, I'm not sure actually. Um, in any case, they were from bare root stock. Um, and you can see this is at the pictures taken the same day at the beginning of the second growing season and the bare root plants are way ahead in terms of size and development. Um, and all the current plants we got as well were plug plants and pretty slow to get started. Um, and consequently, we didn't fruit any of those um, plug started plants in their second year. And so that's, that's a real drawback. Um, you know, generally you expect currants and gooseberries to produce a decent yield in their second season. Um, and, but since the plants were just so small, we felt like we had to defruit them and let them give them time to put on more vegetative growth. Uh, so yeah, here's another picture showing one of the, the plug current plants on the left. On the right is a plant that's actually not from um, the trellising trial, but it's another current plant we started uh, last year at the same time in 2020 from a bare root plant, you know, again, a much bigger plant at the beginning of the second season. Um, I should say that, you know, we, re we received the plugs about a month later in May compared to April. Um, so the bare root plants had a month extra growing time and they were just bigger to, to get started with when we planted them. So um, I assume it's a combination of those things, but they were just much, much stronger plants at the end of the first season. So um, here's some data, uh, you know, so far about the costs we've incurred, um, you know, labor time we've spent, the yields we've had, but we have been able to harvest. Um, we'll be keeping this up for two more years, um, but, you know, kind of wanted to get the discussion going on trellising, you know, as a, as a technique and, um, to share what we've learned so far. So here are um, costs per acre on a per acre basis for the materials um, for 
getting the plantings started. Um, so you can see, you know, per acre, trellis, currants and gooseberries, it's a little over 25,000 just for the, the plants and the physical stuff you need. A um, little under 10,000 for on trellis. So it's, you know, close to a three times as expensive um, for the trellis plantings. And that's basically because of two things. One is, in the trellis plots, we're planting twice as many plants. Remember, they're, they're 18 inches apart as opposed to 36 inches. So that adds up. That's a big difference in the cost of the plants. Um, and then also, of course, we're putting up a trellis, buying the stakes, the wire, um, all costs money. And so um, those two factors were about equal in terms of you know, how much the extra cost they contributed. Um, and then you know, notice that the other things we bought, the landscape fabric and the irrigation, which are the blue and the red chunks on those bars, um, were pretty small and you know, fairly insignificant. It's, we're mostly paying for plants and trellis uh, to get these, get these crops started. So that's a pretty big um, head start. Or, or the, the trellis plots are, you know, have a pretty big um, hurdle to overcome if they're going to be more profitable. Um, that they've got to justify this really high upfront cost of, you know, an extra $17,000 per acre, um, roughly. And so this slide shows the labor time that was invested in the first two seasons. Um, so we broke this up a little differently here. Uh, so the, the left two bars are for the currants. And then for the gooseberries, we separated the captivator which is the only variety that produced a significant yield um, from the other three varieties. So recall that you know, two of the gooseberries we got as plugs, so we didn't let them yield the second year. There was one variety, black velvet, which we got as a bare root plant. It's a fairly shy yielding variety um, and just didn't really produce significantly, even though it flowered fairly heavily in the second year, it didn't produce a significant amount of fruit. So we didn't really harvest any measurable or saleable yield. Um, but in any case, um, I mean, working through this chart from the bottom up, I mean, you know, there's a fair amount of time that was spent the same, whether the plots were trellised or on trellised. And that's things like, you know, mowing, weeding, setting up the irrigation system, uh, installing deer fencing around the plot um, and laying the landscape fabric. Um, then there's the green shows the planting time and the planting time was about twice as much for the trellised plots as the on trellis, because again, twice as many plants, the higher plant density leads to, uh, more time spent planting. In our case, we were planting by hand. Uh, so, you know, those times would be lower if you have some kind of, you know, machine mechanical transplanter sort of set up for planting. Uh, the purple is for the construction of the trellis. So zero time in the on trellis plots, but fairly significant time in the trellis plots. And then even more time consuming than building the trellis was the time spent actually training the, pl the plants in the trellis plot. So that's that turquoise chunk there. And, um, you know, basically we're going through during the growing season and you know, cutting off extra shoots that are coming up from the crown of the plant. So we only want you know, three cordons on a current, one cordon on a gooseberry. So when the plants try to produce more than that, we're going through and clipping them off a few times every summer. Um, and then we're also taping the cordons to the bamboo stakes uh, with that max tapener tool. Um, so, you know, and that a few passes over the course of the season, uh, on every plant, you know, it adds up to a significant amount of time. Um, now, the other thing that is on this chart is the actual time spent harvesting. Uh, and any time growing any berry and hand harvesting it is uh, really labor intensive. You know, you're picking a lot of small <laughs> things off of every plant. Um, and that's, that's definitely true for currants and gooseberries. Uh, so, you know, the captivator was the only variety that produced a significant yield. Um, and you know, one thing you see is how quickly uh, harvest you know, time becomes dominant over all the other tasks <laughs> you do in a, in a berry planting. Um, 
you know, in that on trellis captivator gooseberry, we spent way more time picking than we did doing everything else combined in the first two years. Um, so, and yeah, the harvest time was um, significantly less in the trellis gooseberry than the on trellis. However, as I'm about to show you, the yield was also less. So, um, to keep that in mind too. So yeah, the um, as I said, Captivator was the only variety we could pick from in the second year. Um, the picture on the left is from, the, both of these pictures were taken on the same day in July while we were out there harvesting. Um, the picture on the left is from an on trellis plant. The picture on the right is from a trellis plant. And a couple of differences you can see there. One is that the, the on trellis on the left, you know, has just has a much denser canopy. You see there's a lot more stems and leaves and berries, everything. It's just really dense. Um, the other difference is that the trellis plant on the right, the berries are much more colorful. I mean, they're riper. Um, so the, the actual maturity of the fruits was earlier on the trellis plants. You know, these pictures were taken on the same day um, and the trellis plant, it just had much, a much greater percentage of its fruits were ripe. Um, and uh, these charts here show sort of yield and, and harvest speed. Um, essentially, the trellis plants had only about half the yield as on trellis. Um, and, you know, that's mostly just a result of having fewer branches on the plant that were producing fruit. You know, there's an more, there's a sparser canopy, there was less area or, you know, volume of canopy and then fewer fruits accordingly, I think. Um, it's not because, you know, that the trellis had a lower density of berries along each branch. It's just there were fewer branches in the, in the canopy. Um, and, this may be something that declines over time. You know, this is only the yield from the first year. Um, the trellis plants, you know, they were pretty large and healthy, but they hadn't really reached the top of the trellis. And that trellis is about uh, six feet high, five feet high. And um, it takes a couple of years, you know, for the plants to sort of reach the top and to colonize all the space on the trellis. And a bu the bush plants will never get five and a half feet tall. Um, you know, they're sort of stuck around two and a half, three feet in height. Um, so when the trellis plants actually have had the time to reach their full height, we sort of expect the yield may improve and may become a little more equivalent to the on trellis, or at least in this first year, the on trellis outperformed them um, yield wise. Now, as far as the speed of the harvest. I mean, that's, we anticipated that one of the big benefits from having the plants on the trellis would be that it would be much quicker to pick, um, just be easier to get our hands into the, into the canopy and, and do the harvesting. Um, certainly all of the people who were doing the picking reported enjoying it a lot more when they were picking from the trellis plants. Um, it's a lot more, uh, Intim a lot less intimidating to reach your hands into that thorny canopy um, when you're dealing with a very narrow, open canopy. Um, so everyone enjoyed picking from the trellis plants, but that didn't actually translate into a huge increase in speed. Um, you know, we were doing about 14 half pints an hour as opposed to 12 in the, in the bush plants. So a little bit of increase, but not, a, not as huge as I actually anticipated. Um, but I think we didn't collect data, but I think the number of uh, thorns stuck under people's, you know, fingernails and number of band-aids applied was significantly less in the on trellis um, plantings. But um, so I, you know, I think the improved, there was a significant improvement in morale and uh, quality of life while picking from the trellis plots. And here we have a little a chart showing um, harvest by harvest date. So, you know, the gooseberries don't mature all at once. Um, and you know, there's sort of a compromise in picking ones that are dead ripe and picking many times versus being a little more tolerant of a range of maturities and picking fewer times. Um, 
you know, on the one extreme, you can like go out and pick every two days if you want to get dead ripe berries. On the other extreme, you can pick once and get a lot of not so ripe berries. And people actually do both of those. Unripe gooseberries, you know, are edible. Um, it's it's not, they're not absolutely, you know, unsaleable. So some people will sort of pick once or twice and sell a real mix of maturities in the same pint container. Um, we picked three times and found that was a pretty reasonable compromise for our markets and giving a flavor that we were, you know, um, accepting of. And in the first harvest, um, the trellis plants have out, actually outproduced the on trellis because they, their maturity tended to be so much earlier and more uniform. Um, but by the last harvest, the trellis plants were producing very little, whereas the on trellis, you know, still had a lot at that point. Um, so this is just, again, showing the earlier maturity in the trellis plants and the more uniform maturity, but lower overall yield. And I assume the, the earlier maturity and more uniform maturity probably had to do with better sunlight penetration into the canopy. Um, but, you know, that's, I don't know that for sure. So that was all about uh, the trial on our farm. And I just want to share a few pictures and, and information from um, Jason Fishbox planting. So I, I mentioned he's in far northern Wisconsin in Ashland. So that's like on, you know, on Lake Superior, basically. Um, and he's a, an extension agent up there um, who's been interested in, in, in currants, particularly. He hasn't really worked much with gooseberries. Um, and he's got a trial inside a high tunnel. So this is something that is, is done in Europe too, to my, as far as I know, um, growing the plants inside high tunnels. I'm not personally experienced with that, um, but I assume it you know, gives some earliness and may increase the yield, probably improves disease control a lot since you don't have rain on the foliage. Um, in any case, yeah, Jason's trial, he's been, he's been growing the um, plants in an unheated high tunnel. Uh, unlike us, it seems like he started all with bare root planting stock. Uh, he's got the plants on landscape fabric, similar to in our trial. He's actually using 18 inch spacing in both the trellis and the on trellis plants. So that's a, a difference. Um, and this table shows some yields. Um, he has both a, a single row trellis and a double row where I know there's sort of two rows planted close together. Um, but uh, basically, sort of like we found, the, the bush plants actually out yielded the trellis ones in the first year. And he's picked for an additional year and found that the yields, um, you know, uh, became more equal in the, in the second year. And um, also reports really, especially with the currents here, it's really big difference in the number of berries on a strig, you know, so the number of berries in the cluster and the size of the berries. So that those strigs on the left um, were from a trellised plant inside the high tunnel. And the strigs on the right, the miserable looking ones were from bush grown plants outside. So that's a comparison between trellis and on trellis, but also a comparison between high tunnel and outdoor plants. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a problem, you know, in our experience growing currants for the last decade that, yeah, these outdoor ones, especially as the plants get older and get denser, those bushes just produce tons of small strigs like that with a, just a handful of berries on each one. And since you're picking them by the strig, you know, a whole strig at a time, it's way quicker if you can get some nice long strigs of big berries uh, you can fill up you know, your pine containers a lot more quickly when you're harvesting than when you're picking those little tiny guys. So the other thing I mentioned early on uh, was that we had had big problems in the past with anthracnose leaf spot on our gooseberries. Uh, so this is a fungal disease, um, causes those kind of dark purple spots you see in the picture here. And, uh, the affected leaves or infected leaves fall off the plant early and lead to so just defoliation, um, which is really like pronounced, especially in, in wetter years. Um, and this was one of the reasons we were pretty reluctant to expand gooseberry production. 
And it was one of the reasons we were interested in trying out the trellis uh, was, you know, we wanted to see if having that narrower canopy with better airflow would reduce the incidence of this disease. So here's a picture again. I think this is the same picture I showed earlier of berries on a trellis plant at harvest time. And uh, these look beautiful and they are beautiful, um, but what's missing here are all the leaves. Um, you know, those, those two-year-old branches, like the, the woodier branches that are producing the berries, uh, you know, back in May, they were covered with leaves. Um, and this is mid-July at harvest and they have no leaves. Um, because they've all dropped off. And presumably the main reason for that is because they had anthracnose. Um, you notice that the leaves that remain don't actually have that many spots. Um, they seem to fall off really quickly after they develop the disease. So you don't see leaves that are just covered with spots and they're getting all black and hanging on the plant. Like they get a few spots and then boom, they fall off the plant as sort of the progression um, of the disease. And so you have often like relatively healthy looking leaves with a few spots and otherwise no leaves. Um, and as soon as those leaves start to get more infected, they'll fall off too, basically. Um, and so, yeah, as I mentioned, trellis plants like the one on the left have a much sparser canopy. So we were hoping um, much less disease than the bush plants like on the right. So, um, we actually had sort of a multi you know, factor trial going on here. We have trellis and on trellis. We have the four varieties. We also tried out some different sprays, um, like OMRI listed materials that we can spray in organic production um, to see if they would also help to control the disease. Um, it, yeah, I, I don't want to get in, a lot into the sprays, but we, we tried regalia, which is like a natural plant extract that's sort of an immune booster for the plants, for the crop, um, as well as Cueva, which is a copper product um, and often mixed together with this double nickel. It's a beneficial bacteria. Um, and then the third thing is uh, carbonator brand, which is um, like a type of baking soda, essentially potassium bicarbonate that has antifungal activity. Um, so we've been doing this for a year, this con disease control trial, and we'll continue it as well. Um, but basically uh, trellising does reduce disease. Um, you can see we, we went through sort of twice during the season in early summer and again in the beginning of September. Um, in, in June, we were sort of assessing the average number of spots per leaf. Um, and the trellis plants had fewer spots, but they still had quite a few. Um, and then in September, we looked at how much defoliation had happened I mean, in on trellis plants, like, you know, 80% of the leaves had fallen off by then. And in trellis plants, it was closer to 60%. So again, it was an improvement, but certainly the trellising didn't eliminate the disease entirely. Um, and the, there's big differences in variety susceptibility. Um, in our case, the tixia stood out for being super susceptible. Um, and Hinomaki red, stood out as being um, fairly resistant, like it still had most of its leaves in September, whereas the other varieties had very few leaves in September. And then as far as the organic sprays we try, I mean, again, none of them really eliminated the disease. The copper certainly kept it in check. Um, and the regalia um, plant extract was somewhat effective too, it seems. So, I mean, the overall conclusion from that is that there's no silver bullet uh, that we're aware of yet, certainly. Um, but, you know, probably some kind of integrated approach of growing fairly, at least fairly resistant varieties and trellising and maybe doing some sprays, you know, all together might keep things to manageable levels um, of, of disease. So um, that's all I had prepared as far as a talk here. Um, if you want to see more details on any of this, um, we have on our website like a fairly extensive written summary, you know, with exactly what we did for pruning and when we did it and how the varieties were different and so on. Um, 
And that's at twoonionfarm.com slash research. And, and I'm happy to talk to anyone you know, later afterwards. Email is the best way to reach me. Um, so yeah, I, I see there's something in the chat here. Um, okay, that's um, the link to that article. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to sort of answer more questions. Um, I guess the, the first question there is how would black currents respond to this kind of training? And maybe Eric would speak to that better actually, because I've never grown, well, we had a couple of black current plants here at one time and pretty quickly decided that with our primarily fresh market focus, that wasn't gonna to appeal to many people, um, at least in our markets. We didn't really like them that much personally either. Um, so that probably played into it. So we, we don't grow them. We only have red, uh, white, and pink in our trial. Um, so I don't know, do you have thoughts, Eric? Uh, I do actually, yeah. Um, and when I was in the Netherlands, they, they had some of the black currants on trellis. Um, and again, that was for a U-pick operation. So it made sense for that. But, you know, the, the advantage of the black currants is that, you know, they, they do go to a fresh market, um, but they're, with their thicker skins, they're better for processing. And so, you know, when, when we harvest black currants, the advantage is, is that we can use machine harvesting or shakers and stuff like that. So, you know, a freestanding bush is, you know, way friendlier with the shaker system or with a, a full over the row harvester compared to the trellising line. Um, but I do think the black currants could respond well. The other difference that I've noticed, like in terms of the plant growth, is that the black currants don't tend to do as well with older wood, whereas the red and white currants and the gooseberries in particular, they can they can have some really nice, you know, three four year old base stems within the branches on top. Whereas the black currants, they seem like they they get diseases quicker. Um, you know, we try to keep them into a one or two year stem mainly. And so when you do the trellising methods, it, you have to, you know, you really have to keep pulling out those base stems compared to the red and white currants and the gooseberries just do really great about, you know, holding on to those, those stems for quite a few years. So they, it seems like the, you know, my recommendations are always the red and white currants and gooseberries are the, are the way to go for trellising. And black currants, you know, at this point, I would still probably keep it more at a freestanding bush. <laughs> Next question here uh, is the same spacing used for Dutch and English methods. Um, English seems to promote taller, narrower plants. Uh, do the trellis plants eventually outgrow the six foot trellis? Yeah, I mean, my experience is obviously not, you know, super extensive either to answer the, some of these questions, but I, I mean, with grout growing the height of the trellis, I have um, seen some people saying that, you know, cutting the, the stem back at the top, um, but I think that's more to promote branching rather than to actually keep them, you know, contained at that height. Um, yeah, I, I, don't really anticipate that them growing, outgrowing that height will be a huge issue. I mean, they're not trees by nature. And um, even getting them up to six feet is, is essentially outside their normal growth habit. Um, so that's my gut instinct on that. Um, as far as the spacing, I think it's generally the same. I mean, certainly Jason, you know, in his trial has used 18 inches as well, and he's using the English method. Um, thing to keep in mind, I think, is that in the English method, you're, you're allowing more branches along the cordon. Um, so um, yeah, it, you know, it, is, it's, it seems like you might, they might have a narrower canopy and they do, but um, in, the, in terms of like their total number of leaves and all, it might be actually fairly similar. Um, you know, in the Dutch technique, you have longer, but many fewer branches. And so um, may not really, you know, all pencil out into needing to space them apart further. That makes sense. Did you guys do any flavor profiling between the two methods? Or did you? Yeah, get, I mean, informally, or... yes. Um, <laughs> and test. Uh, quite a lot of informal flavor profiling while picking. Um, and I, I wouldn't say we noticed a huge difference or really anything significant. Um, yeah. 
at least, at least in that one gooseberry variety. I, I could see that making sense. You know, there, you, you're getting a little more light penetration, so I might increase some of the this, the, you know, the the sugars and bring down the acidity. But um, from our own trials, it does seem very much more genetic based than, you know, light penetration or anything like that. But it's always fun doing the taste test. Those are, that's my favorite part of being a crop scientist <laughs> and, an, and an informal uh, uh, farmer there too, is we, we get a lot of taste testing as I go through the season. And um, yeah, the, the early season uh, uh, picks that you get, because you're like, oh, it's starting to turn color are sometimes the, <laughs> the biggest turnoff to these plants, I'd say. They can be pretty astringent. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, and with, with the gooseberries, there is this real, um, real, as I said, this real trade-off between how many times do you want to go back through there <laughs> to get that, like, peak flavor, um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's kind of a just labor and market issue of, you know, what you can tolerate in terms of labor and then what your market can tolerate in terms of unripe berries. Um, yeah, well, so I've also heard, though, that for gooseberries that you can use, um, some of the more unripe gooseberries for like jams and preserves if they have a higher pectin content and if you're already adding sugar um have you noticed that as well or do you, do you notice that like for your markets that you might have a jam maker that is preferring uh more the unripe and or is it pretty universal that people just want a nice good pretty looking gooseberry for their tarts and, and the yeah dessert? see um we mix them in the same container like we're not because that's sort of the whole point almost of doing it is that you can just pick 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 and then not be like sorting them out into different containers while you're picking. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I for us, most people are buying them for fresh eating, um, mm -hmm. not for processing. And that, I mean, I that's kind of what I know in, in, in our experience of selling produce for a long time, you know, in this day and age, most people aren't super interested in spending a lot of time in their kitchen, you know, <laughs> cooking desserts and jams and things from scratch, honestly. Um, they're more looking for the quick snack food to give to their kids in the car um, mm -hmm. and that, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, and, and I have heard the same thing about the pectin and all, um, and that may well be true. We've, never, we've tried freezing, but not really making jam and all. Um, you know, it's just, unripe gooseberries are not like devastating, unpleasant or bad. They're just not quite as sweet as the really ripe mm -hmm. ones. Um, so you can see, you know, once they've had a little bit of color change, they're, they're pretty edible and, um, but maybe just not quite as premium edible as the really ripe ones. I can see that. Yep. I do like the color variation of what they have when you have a mixed little mixed pint together and you have that sort of range from the green to the, the reds, to the purples. Um, it makes a really attractive looking, looking pint that you sell in the stores. Yep. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's also variety differences like Captivator and then I'm trying to think of the other one, like Pormans uh, and I think Amish Red, like they're all, I feel like they're all more amenable to, or they taste better when they're on right. So they did this one time or just a couple harvests seems to work better. Some of the other ones like Black Velvet, I feel like you really want to get it when it's pretty ripe as far mm -hmm. as it just doesn't really have the flavor earlier, but yeah. Yeah, how it all builds in and everything. Um, so for, I got a question about the disease trial. Um, mm -hmm. Have you guys considered using Serenade? We use Serenade in the past. It's, um, uh, I think it's a bacterial spray, Omri listed, that we had somewhat good success for leaf spot. Um, you know, were there a few other combinations? Why did you pick the, the, the three that you picked, I guess? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's... Um... It was somewhat arbitrary. Yeah, it was partially just a matter of you know the logistics and how many, how much we could split these plots up and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I to be frank, it was largely on the basis of our. We do quite a bit of disease spraying on our apples, and have mm -hmm. never had very good luck with serenade. Um, yeah, <laughs> which isn't really a you know a, a valid reason maybe for excluding it here. But we had to make some choices, and we sort of stuck with the ones that have worked best for us in apples. <laughs> that makes sense. I think it's a great reason there. I'm interested to hear about that. Yeah. And the other, the other thing is, you know, powdery mildew is a pretty big issue and not so much here, but I, as I understand in, in some other regions or mm -hmm. different varieties too. Um, have you done trials for controlling that? 
So our disease trials have actually only been limited to, we have an issue with cane dieback in our, in our occurrence. And so that's what we've been trialing. Um, but I've, I have fought powdery mildew extensively. And actually the uh, potassium bicarbonate was my favorite. You know, that, that seemed to work really well. And I, um, our disease, you know, the powdery mildew starts popping up in, you know, June for us, really quite evident. And it starts getting a little too hot to spray. We were using horticultural oil for quite a while. And that's nice, but then it starts clogging the pores. And if it gets too hot, all of a sudden our plants get really upset about that. And so that, that was a nice thing about potassium bicarbonate is we could spray that all through the season. And it, it did a great job of kicking back the, the disease and, and not affecting the plants. And mentally, I feel like the potassium has to do something for those plants <laughs> a little bit, you know, but I don't know if that's fully true or not. Um, and we did, uh, you know, the best method we had for actually dealing with the leaf spot was, uh, going through and bagging the leaves. Like we went through and used like a little mower with a bagger on it. And then we bagged up all the leaves, um, you know, right after harvest and another time in the fall. And that seemed to do a good job of at least removing the disease presence, but, um, it did come back later on and, you know, whether or not it's a, a great method to continuously do. Um, it's just, it's a very difficult disease and it's, it, I think it's just present, you know, it's not something that you can, <laughs> you know, sort of wash away, um, repeatedly. So yeah, it's been sort of the downside is the, the, the leaf spot has been particularly hard and the, and the powdery mildew. Um, looks like Casey has another question here. Um, what soil pH is preferred by gooseberries and currants? Um, is it consistent for all varieties? And um, I guess I'll let you answer those questions, and then I'll, I'll continue on to the last question there. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess <laughs> I'm not sure about the pH now. I know we kind of looked up to it, when we looked into it when we planted this plot. I believe we did add some sulfur to get it. Our pH tends to run a little high. I think we added some to get mm -hmm. it below into the high sixes. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have more information on that, Eric? I mean, that's sort of our issue as well. We're, we're planting them in uh, central Illinois. Um, and then also we have a planting up in, in Beloit, Wisconsin. But both sites are um, fairly uh, high pH, you know, uh, when everything I've read online has been, you know, in, in, in literature is that, you know, the current's like a, a five to a six, you know, they're higher than, a, they like a higher pH than a blueberry, but um, definitely more acidic than what, you know, you typically use in vegetable production. But, you know, in our in our seven pH soil, they're still growing well. So um, we do notice sometimes some nutrient issues with like manganese and, and magnesium um, that could be kind of caused by those pH imbalances. But um, for the most part, the sulfur doesn't really bring it down quick enough or, you know, assuredly enough uh, for me to really feel comfortable using that as our control method for that. Um, we've actually moved more towards just adding foliar sprays to make up for any soil pH issues. Um, but we haven't done any, and I haven't seen any research on the pH across varieties. Um, that seems like a nice, really nice pot trial that would be done. But um, as far as I know, there haven't been any trials on that. So if there's any professors out there looking to do fun <laughs> research projects, we'd love to see it. But um, I haven't seen that. And how do you, uh, do, do you have deer issues up there? Uh, deer control, what do you do for deer issues? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have minor deer issues. Um, so actually we, we grew vegetables and apples here for many years without, really, without doing anything for deer, just had them sitting out there. Um, and just in the last couple of years, started to see a little bit of deer browse. So we, in Wisconsin, you can get, um, funding from the state to um, put up, once you've had documented damage, to put up a minimal deer fence, which is I think like six foot high plastic mesh. So I mean, clearly something that a deer could jump over, but mm -hmm. maybe a deterrent. And if they're not, they don't have really well established traffic patterns or motivation for going through your planting, it might be sufficient. Um, and that's what we've done. We've, we've closed all our apples and the currants and gooseberries with that deer fencing. Um, and it seems to be working well in our very low pressure situation. Um, mm -hmm. 
yeah, but I know people who have orchards with a lot of deer pressure have found that those six foot mesh fences to be fairly insufficient and, you know, have gone to tall and taller mm -hmm. chain link fences and yeah. Um, yeah, our planting is enclosed by an eight to 10 foot fence metal. And then we have another um, trials that we have that we use the electric fencing, the, the double strand, the two strand, and then the one strand that kind of throws off their depth perception. And that kind of works until the deer discover it and then they start bedding in there. And <laughs> have you noticed any other pest issues? In terms of um, insect, yes. Um, so uh, we've seen the um, current spanworm. Um, mm. So that's, I think often people are, you mentioned the, I, I think it's the imported current worm. Is that the mm -hmm. right word, Eric? I think so, um, yeah. Yeah, now that's one we haven't seen. Um, but this current spanworm um, is, yeah, it's like a looper, um, you know, a caterpillar that inches along. Um, and yeah, it, it, it um, appears in early summer. I mean, sprays of BT in our case have been really effective, but mm -hmm. we have found in past years on our smaller plantings that on control, it can be totally devastating and just like defoliate plants. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was worth have you noticed any, for. Have you noticed cultivar differences? Uh, you know, do the, do the worms prefer one over the other? No, um, okay. seems like in the currents it just, uh devastated them all um haven't seen it as much in gooseberries i guess i can't say if it's really variety specific or not but yeah certainly okay. not in the currents yeah i i noticed that we had some 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 caterpillar damage on you know just like specific cultivar uh it was a detvin red current and it, they just seemed to like that one for some reason something about those leaves um and I will say, I guess to, to kind of go back to the deer issues, uh, black currants, they don't, the, the deer don't browse the black currants. So if you do have a, you know, if you want to plant out currants and you, you have a lot of deer pressure, the black currants are a nice way of doing that. They, they produce the, um, they have little sessile glands. And I mean, if you've ever touched a black currant, you've smelled that, you know, that pungency and that tends to keep the deer away. So that's always exciting. Do you have any issues with voles or mice or, you know, Anything like that? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we do see them under this landscape fabric mm -hmm. and it makes me nervous. Um, I mean, yeah, fabric is a you know notorious attractant for those rodents. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it hasn't seemed to have been really severe in terms of any damage yet, but it certainly makes me a little nervous. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in our, in our apple trees, we use bark mulch mm -hmm. um, instead of not this plastic fabric um and that that definitely discourages voles like we never find rodents in the bark um, yep. hardwood bark um, but i reluctant to do it in the currents and gooseberries just because of their sort of habit of suckering and uh, <laughs> having the plants sort of expand over time you know with the landscape fabric like you see in this picture you're keeping a fairly narrow band of soil open and it can't grow out of there this you know it's not possible so yep yeah, that's that's sort of I love the the weed fabric barrier because weed control is very difficult in the currents, but the bowl issue is what really concerns me. And i we've lost a few plants from the voles like to hang out underneath the, the shrub root system, you know, and I don't know if they necessarily chew out the roots as much as they just kind of, you know, remove all the soil and you can just pick up those current plants. <laughs> it's it's a little sad to see them go, but you know. Overall, the damage has been actually pretty, fairly minimal, I'd say, on on, a, on an acreage basis. Have you tried using neem oil spray at all? We haven't, no. We, we, we haven't tried it either. I, my thought on that, Melissa, on, you know, how do currents respond to neem oil spray is that it'd be similar to the horticultural oil that we sprayed and that the, um, the plants do pretty well as long as you, you don't you know, when it gets above 85, 90 degrees, the plants really start to um, get pretty upset that you start clogging the pores for too long and the currents really don't do well with the heat stress. So, you know, you're stressing them more when you spray them, but I don't believe the neem itself would be really too much of an issue. Um, 
to the plants. They, they seem to respond pretty well to, to most sprays. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. We've also had some oil phytotoxicity on gooseberries as mm -hmm. well. So yeah, I think it's, yeah. And was that a was that a temperature dependent thing or was that just outside well, of temperature? So that only occurred on Captivator and it was very early in the spring. So it wasn't a temperature oh. issue. And then we just stopped spraying them at all. So maybe the other varieties would have shown it when it was hotter, as you say. But yeah, the yeah. oil and heat don't mix in general. You know, but yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Okay, well, um, I think we'll end it here. Again, if anyone has any more questions, feel free to email Chris um, at twoonionfarm at gmail.com. Uh, Chris, this has been exciting. Um, I'm really excited to see the, the progression in a couple of years and, and more results. And um, thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, yeah. I would just address that last question real quick uh -huh. about row spacing. We did like 10 feet. I think that it mostly depends on your equipment. Yep. Um, you know, you, how small of a tractor do you have to fit down there for mowing and stuff? And that's my take on it. Yep, I would 100% I would agree with that because we've, we've had some trials where eight foot is just fine hand harvesting and some, some trials are 12 foot and we can't get the tractors down that well. So um, it's gonna be very dependent. I think it's as much equipment and getting yourself in there um, as anything else. So great. Well, thank you so much. And with that, um, this is recorded. So we'll be able to view it later on if anyone wants to, you know, make up for parts they missed. And um, with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and a good weekend. Go eat some uh, currants and gooseberries. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.